this morning, if you could bottle the presence of God that's here this morning, you could be a millionaire overnight. We'd have pushers out on the corner. <laughs> oh, isn't it amazing that uh, what people really need isn't at the bottom of a whiskey bottle. It's not something that you can snort up your nose, but you just got to open your heart to the king of the universe. Surrender to Jesus and that which people would pay all the money in the world to receive, he gives freely. I thought it was interesting that as we are dealing with new wineskins, we've been dealing last week with the, the first part of the menorah. It's going to take me three weeks just to cover the menorah. Last week we discovered Jesus in the menorah. We discovered that was encoded into the menorah that, that he is the vine, we are the branches, and that the only way that we can draw from the anointing of God is we got to abide the vine. And so in the midst of all this, at sunset tonight, Hanukkah starts. Now, in December 25th, uh, 175 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes he invaded Jerusalem. He sacrificed a hog on the holy altar of God. He erected a statue of Apollos in the temple of Almighty God. He did it on December 25th because that was the birthday of Apollos. In fact, it's the birthday of every single sun god in paganism. Three years to the day later, the Maccabees drove Antiochus Epiphanes out of Israel, out of Judah, and they began the entire process of cleansing the temple from both Hellenistic influence and paganism. Now, there's also a story that many try to attach to Hanukkah about the miracle of the oil, and to be truthful, the more that I research, most modern rabbis have realized that in the earliest stories of Hanukkah, that wasn't included. It was kind of added later on to embellish. And so we can get all caught up with the oil for the eight days, but the truth of the matter is if you get caught up in that, you miss the significance. It's the Feast of Dedication. It's a time for us to take a hard look at our lives and see where Antiochus Epiphanes has snuck back in with his Hellenism and his paganism. And that we need, this needs to be a time of the year that God turns on the lights and lets you look down into every nook and cranny of the temple and to see if there's any pig anywhere, if there's any Hellenism anywhere. And I think it's interesting that we call it Hellenism because hell has snuck in. But we also need to look at the traditions of men. Didn't Jesus say that the traditions of men make void the word of God, make void the commandments of God? And so we have moved from a feast of dedication that the world is celebrating Apollo's birthday once again, and they have Christianized it and called it Jesus' birth, yet everything about it is pagan. If you only knew what the Christmas tree represented, if you only knew what the ornaments that hung on it represented, if you only knew what the wreath represented, any modest Christian would blush. But yet we open up the windows and open up the curtains and put lights on it so that the whole world can see what we got. Can you, can you see how the, 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 the sneakiness of the enemy, while well, the kingdom... And the anointing of the Holy Spirit this time of year is about getting all that stuff out. We bring it all up in and we set it in. And uh, guys, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to celebrate the winter solstice because the winter solstice is the antithesis to the Feast of Dedication. It is anti-dedication. You see why we need new, we need new wineskins? God needs to give us a new heart that doesn't hunger after these things, but rather hunger after the kingdom of God. Now, that is not really a part of this teaching at all. That was just a commercial before the teaching. <laughs> I want to get back into the menorah this morning. And I want to start in Revelation chapter five, 4 and verse 5. You know, after uh, last week... Pastor Outhouse came up and said, I can't believe that was in the, menorah, in, the, in the menorah. Every time we go through, yeah, 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 there's a menorah. It represents the Holy Spirit. Let's move on. No, we're going to park here, Walker. There's a whole lot of stuff encoded into it. 
Revelation 4 and 5, and says, Out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunder and voices, and there are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, that's actually a very poor translation. How many know there aren't seven Holy Ghosts? It is most accurately translated the sevenfold Spirit of God. There are, there are seven things he's about. And I want to get into those seven things this morning because uh, one of the things that really just kind of began to bear down in my spirit this morning, the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. But if we don't let him enter into his sevenfold ministry, we frustrate him. And let me tell you something. With the modern church, the Holy Spirit is frustrated. The church don't want to hear anything but grace. Grace. Or how he's going to make you rich. Let me tell you something. I, I have found there are things better than money. Now, I know that may be a shock to some. Even Solomon in his frustration in Ecclesiastes says money answers everything. But if you really go back and set that back into context, that is the attitude of man. But yet he was saying the vanity of it. But yet I've had preachers get up and say money answers everything. Let me tell you something. You got cancer throughout your body, and the world says there is no hope. You can be a billionaire and die. You can be a millionaire and be so wounded on the inside that you don't want to live. And how many times have we seen the rich take their lives because they had no hope? There's a whole lot more to life than money. Money is handy, but it isn't the essential thing. Heard one preacher say, you know, being broke getting to sin, but it sure is unhandy. Well, I can agree with that, but I'm talking about some deeper things than money. Let's go, and I want to go to the traditional interpretation of this or what most commentators will refer to. When you read about the sevenfold spirit of God, they always take you back to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. And I want to touch on that, and I've taught on that so many times here. We've taught on it in Kingdom Authority Warfare 2. We've taught on it in Leadership of One, and I've probably taught on it 5, 10, 15, 20 times besides that. Just because repetition is the mother of learning. But let's read it here, 11 and 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of wisdom and the fear of the Lord. And this is talking about the Messiah. That when the Holy Spirit came upon Messiah, he released the sevenfold ministry, the sevenfold anointing into the life of Messiah. And Dake so wonderfully points out the first one is the Spirit of the Lord. And I think that's important because how many know there's a lot of spirits in the world? Now, what Dake didn't do, which he should have, and I should have corrected in these notes, that should have been capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the spirit of Yahweh. Not the spirit of Baal, not the spirit of Apollo or Zeus, but Yahweh Elohim. And I want, to, I want you to see something, how it's sandwiched in here. So it's the spirit of Yahweh, so it, it shows who that he is serving and whom he is representing. And then it goes the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel uh, and might, and the spirit of knowledge. And then it ends it on the other end with the fear of Yahweh. The spirit of Yahweh and the fear of Yahweh. And let me tell you something, what the Holy Spirit's going to do in your life is always going to sandwich between the reality of who God is and our reverential fear of who he is. And the body of Christ has no fear of the Lord anymore, yet the word tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How many know that's all good stuff? But I'm going to pull a Paul Harvey this morning, and I want to get into the, another, the rest of the story, because there's some other things that God has really been dealing with me about that I really want to get into. You want to go ahead and dive into it this morning? Let's go to John chapter 16, verses 7 through 15. And as we really begin to unfold this, now, we have Pentecostal churches talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but really, we don't let him move. We let him move in the things that our flesh likes. How many know that when, how many know hoop and hollering is good for the soul? Come on now. We did a little bit of that this morning. It's good for the soul. And if you can cheer for, the, for a football team, 
or for a basketball team, you can let out a little shout unto the Lord. It's okay. But when you turn that into a fleshly thing to make you feel good and you forget about the Lord, how many know that's a whole other thing? And a lot of the, what we see in the charismatic movement has, re- everything is about being seeker sensitive. Now, if you haven't noticed about biblical life, I don't, I'm not sensitive about you at all. <laughs> I'm really not, I don't, I don't mean to be gruff about it. You know, it's like, if you don't like it, there's the door because what I, who I want to come through that door is Almighty God. And I want him to be here. And if he's here, I'm happy. And if nobody else shows up, God and I are a majority. Him and I can party together. We can have a wonderful time together. But I can have a thousand people here and he doesn't show up. I don't want to be here. That's just the truth of the matter. And that's the way it really needs to be. It's about the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in my life. I don't not only want to have that menorah, I want to have it burning bright in my life. So let's look at what Jesus said here about the Holy Spirit, starting in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I love that verse. I underline it in every Bible I got. He's judged. He's not going to be judged. He is judged. <laughs> I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself. Need to underline that in your Bible, by the way. I hear people always talking about the Holy Spirit speaking of himself. He doesn't do that. He talks about Messiah. He brings out what you need to learn in the Word to walk like Him, to line up with Jesus. You know what I have found, guys? If you actually stick with the Word, you're better off. Come on. Go back to the Word. I'm going to put a pin in that disc for a minute. I'm going to come back to it after I finish reading this. But whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. For he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore say I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now, I just had a one of our Master of Divinity students called this week, and he's graduate of ORU and been a minister for quite a while, and he called upset, and I can, I can really understand why he's upset. He's going to a Baptist church, and in that Baptist church, there's a youth minister going to seminary. I mean, that's a good thing. And this guy's teaching the youth that God can lie. That's what I said. I said, so what? God said, I am a man that I should not lie. It is, it is impossible for God to lie. And he uses some situations, like when, when God was telling Samuel to go anoint David, and he said, well, if I try that, then Saul will kill me. Well, he said, well, also go up and offer up an offering to me so that if he asks you, you can just simply tell him to go up and offer an offering. He didn't lie, did he? No. But this guy's taking this and saying, see, God can lie. How many know that changes everything if God can lie? We're in a world of hurt and it's affecting the whole youth group. And they, they just did this, this circular logic of, well, it's not circular. It's kind of like this. And then they kind of do this and whatever else they got to do. Because if God can lie, then I can do whatever I want to do. How many know that is wrong? <sighs> Why can't that guy teach? The guy going, the youth pastor, going through seminary? Why can't he really teach? Why can't he stay true to the word? He's never done his ministry in the outer court. There's a lot in his life needs to be burned up according to include his fleshly desire that he loved God to be a lie. Because then he can say, well, when God said, thou shalt not commit adultery, really, he, he didn't mean that. And when God said, thou shalt not lie, he didn't really mean that. And How many know that's a slippery slope to hell coated in Teflon? Whatever super slick thing they got now, that devil's out there with slick 50 pouring it down just trying to go ahead and just go on down that thing. I don't want to do that. The Bible says God puts my feet upon a solid rock. But see, if I don't do that outer court experience, 
to where I let God burn up a lot of things in my life, that I can't go into the inner court, learn how to abide in Messiah, or allow the ministry of the Holy Spirit to really take a hold of my life. Because for most Christians, all the Holy Spirit's trying to get them to do is to show them what they need to crucify and what they need to burn up. And he can't take you beyond that until you do that. And so for the rest of it, all these revelations they're getting and everything else about not having to burn things up on the altar isn't of God. They have been turned over to a spirit of error. Because if you've ever looked at the temple, that outer court is humongous. Okay, it's big. But the minute you go into the holy place, <laughs> they're just like, you know, sometimes I look at that, you look at how big the menorah is, you look at how big the table of showbread is, and I think, man, they're just wiggling room, you know. And really, that's, that's a good place to be, just to have wiggling room. Because, number one, he's our teacher. We've got to let the Holy Spirit teach us. Now, the Holy Spirit can use me as an agent to teach you, but did you know that you guys have an anointing to learn 1 John 2 and 27 says, But the anointing that ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is true and is no lie, even it has taught ye, or taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now one of the things that uh, John was dealing with were the Gnostics begin coming in and having all these deep, super deep, crazy revelations. And really most of them they got when they were smoking weed or whatever, you know. And sometimes I hear things from pulpits today, and I think the exact same thing. Why, why did you smoke? Why did you roll? Why did you shoot up before you came up with that thing? Because it did not line up with the Word of God at all. And you're trying to tell me that this is a deep revelation from God. This right here, guys, is the plumb line. And you have an anointing of the Holy Spirit to teach you how to walk this thing. Not to develop some new scheme on how that you can put God in the headlock and make you rich. Or how that you can make God send you more angels. You know, you only need one. You only need one. Ooh, can, can, can I share just something, a little extra, something with you? This is a study I'm doing that's just coming to fire in my heart. How many know there are angels that fell and angels that didn't? And how many know a ministry has an angel? Revelation talks about an angel. Some try to translate that minister. It's not, a, it's angel. And we can get into the divine council and, and uh, Psalms 20, uh, 82 and all these different things. But there's the bad angels and the good angels. Did you know that simply because you're saved doesn't mean you come under the wing of a good angel if you're acting like the devil? You see, there, there, there can't, there's no void. It's one or the other. And what Jesus was warning them in Revelation was, if I remove this angel, it will be replaced with a wrong one. And that will feed you everything it can feed you to take you away from God. And I think a lot of ministries right now are being empowered by dark angels. But if I start repenting and seeking the face of God, making sure everything in my life is under the blood of Jesus, I drive out that angel, and the angel appointed to me by God can begin really working in my life. And I'm not talking about praying to angels. I'm not even talking about worshiping angels. I'm not even talking about even talking to them. I just don't want to frustrate the guy and just let him be able to do his work in my life. The Bible says that he was sent to minister unto heirs of salvation. I want him to be able to minister instead of having to set back. We kind of wonder why. Now, this, this is a side note. We kinda, if I don't let the Holy Spirit teach me how to move in the kingdom, I can bind the hands of the angel who's supposed to watch over me and protect me. And I open up the door to the enemy to attack my life. That's one of the reasons, guys, we see people that understand our Hebraic heritage but are still doing the other stuff, and they wonder why. All hell breaks loose in their life. Let me tell you something. Now, th th this is Ozarkian wisdom. Are you ready? It's deep. If you ride a fence post, or if you ride a fence line, you will run into a post. Guaranteed. You may think you've gotten away with it for a while, but I tell you what, you've got a four by four in your future. That's right. and, we, and we try to ride the fence between the pagan and the kingdom, 
And then we get mad at God when we hit a fence post. I have gotten off the fence. I've gotten over on God's side. I avoid all those fence posts. See, Mike, why are you bringing that up for? Because I'm hearing from believers, guys. Mary and I were talking about just how blessed we are. You know, sometimes to us it may seem a little rough, you know. But man, you start talking across the body of Christ, it's easy breezy. It really is. Why? There are no fence posts in my future. Because I've done exactly what Joshua said. You choose this day whom you're going to serve, but choose. Get on one side or get on the other. Well, I've gotten on God's side of the fence. And as I'm walking, those fence posts are just way over here and they don't touch my life. Guys, we need to let the Holy Spirit teach us. And what he's going to teach us is how to keep the commandments of God. What he's going to teach us, he's going to teach us in the same way that Jesus taught the disciples. How to walk in the kingdom, how not to get it caught up in political games and the games of men, and how to simply walk with God. You have an anointing to teach you how to walk with God. We're going to get more into that next week. There is, there is an anointing for that. The same way there's an anointing to preach and anointing for many other things. The Holy Spirit wants to teach you how to live. Capital L, capital I, capital V, capital E. And for a lot of believers, the reason we don't have the life that we should is we've not allowed to teach him, we've not allowed him to teach us how to really move into it. Have you ever kind of felt like you're in limbo? Spiritually? Everything's just kind of stuck in the workplace and it's stuck in your emotional life and it's stuck in the marriage and it's you're just stuck. That's because you've not allowed him to teach you how to move into something greater. I don't know about you, but I want the greater. For the Holy Spirit, for this menorah, for the feast of dedication, when I come into that holy place, the Holy Spirit is here to teach me how to walk with God. Period. And once I get into that one, I can get into some of the others. But if you're unteachable, how many know you're not going to go very far? I have learned how to be pliable in the hands of God. Now, I learned that on the, on, the, on, the, on the school of hard knocks. Can I tell you how that I, I, I was introduced in 1992 to our Hebraic heritage? Dr. John Gar broke, uh, brought me in as an educational consultant for the Hebraic Heritage Colloquium. He brought in experts from all over the world. I was fascinated. I was intrigued. These guys loved on me, gave me all their stuff. I brought it back up, and I stuck it on the shelf along with all my other hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books and materials. And when I wanted to sound really deep, I'd pull out a Dwight Pryor and get a little something good and give it to you guys. You guys would go, wow. I thought, well, this stuff's cool, you know. Then we begin to ministering to people coming out of Satanism, and when the devil really shows up, I mean really shows up, most people don't really know what it is to have the devil show up. You have assassins come after you and they try to poison you and they're killing your animals and they're chasing you on the highways. How many know that you decide, I better change something. And in the midst of all this, God showed us that they were desecrating the Feast of Tabernacles. They kind of sent up my little radar. That's one, of the, that's one of the other reasons we're not supposed to know that, by the way. You're not supposed to know that, but you know it now. Because they think it can hold back or, or detain the return of Christ. And uh, we walked into a Christmas. We had one of them mock us. Say, I got you now. You ain't got me. I tell you what, everybody in the world serving Jesus. You know, you think during Christmas, instead of a C, there's this big S on your chest. Dun, da, da, da. No, I tell you what, never been so sick. Everything, I, even the new stuff was breaking down. And I went to the Lord. Said, Okay. I was expecting Superman and Pee Wee Herman showed up. What is going on? God said, well, you're doing their stuff. You can't do their stuff and expect my kingdom to work. And so we had an incentive for rapid change. That day, everything changed. Okay, we're taking all this junk. Goodbye. <laughs> I choose the ways of God pulled all them books back off the shelf, and I started studying like a crazy man. I was, I was amazed to find out the Bible started before Matthew. 
I was amazed at the uniformity of the word, that if you can't connect the dots anywhere in the Bible all the way back to the Torah, you're not dealing really with a biblical concept. It's all in there. <laughs> and I love being able to start anywhere and following it all the way through. There is absolute uniformity between Genesis all the way to Revelation. Absolute uniformity. Well, Mike, how do you believe that? Can I give you this one? Brother Chuck, God created the heaven and earth in seven days. On the seventh day, he rested. He called it his Sabbath. Okay? When he ends this whole ball of wax, end of Revelation. New heaven, new earth. There's only one day that we celebrate, the Sabbath. <laughs> well, do you think if we started at the beginning and we end up with it at the end, maybe you ought to do her in the middle? Now, that's this, those archaeologic. I didn't have to go to seminary to figure that one out. But see, the Holy Spirit teaches you when you yield to him. And when I pray for most of the body, because I hear guys saying, well, I don't know. We've done it this way so long. My prayer is, God, don't let them have assassins come after them before they decide to do it. Yeah, that's right. Mary and I went into God's fast track school. And we can tell you, they can poison you and the arsenic will work out your flesh. They can pull all the water out of your, uh, all the fluid out of your power steering and fill it full of water where you're supposed to be seizing up when you go down the highway. And instead they find out about it and, and change it and put, pour out all the water, put all the oil back in, and you drive it for another 50,000 miles. Because God's there. Yeah. They can chase you on the highway. And I wish I could said it was a high-speed chase, but it was a broken-down minivan. <laughs> Yeah, God can confuse them and they can't run you off the road. All because of walking in the ways of God. See, that's what the Holy Spirit wants you to teach, teach you is how to overcome the devil, how where the kingdom of darkness can't touch you, and how to walk in the victory that's yours in Messiah. Are you ready for the second one? Teacher. Now, you can't get to the second one until you let him do the first one. Comforter. Now, when we think of comforter, the Holy Ghost is going to come as a big, warm fuzzy. Isn't that what everybody wants? Just give me, give me a big, warm fuzzy. This big teddy bear, Lord. This big teddy bear. Come on, Lord. Well, let's see what this word comforter, perikletos, in the Greek means summons called alongside, especially to one's aid. How many know that sounds good right there? One who pleads another case before a judge, a pleader, counsel for defense, legal assistant, and advocate, who pleads one's cause for another, an intercessor of Christ, and is exalted at the right hand of God, pleads with God, the Father, for the pardon of our sins, in the widest sense, a helper, a, suc a succor, uh, an aid, an assistant, the Holy Spirit destined to uh, take the place of Christ with the apostles after his ascension, to lead them to a deeper knowledge of the gospel truth, to give them divine strength to be able to abide all those wonderful blessings that are going to happen while you're on this earth. Oh, wait a minute. It says to undergo trials and persecution on behalf of the divine kingdom. In other words, how many know Jesus got into the face of his disciples a few times? How would you like to give a, a statement of faith to the Lord? And he, his answer is, get thee behind me, Satan. How many know that was a warm fuzzy for Peter that day? He was just feeling it from head to toe. And Jesus was saying, the Holy Spirit's going to come in and he's going to comfort you the same way that you have learned how to be corrected by me, to be taught by me. To, and how many know that Jesus, there was like a, a, a field of safety around him. They said, as long as the Lord's here, it's okay. It, it, it doesn't matter what... Uh, what the Pharisees are trying to trick him to do in the Sadducees with all their gimmicks, and they're always trying to trick him up, and, and the, the one, you know, they want to kill him, and he just walks right out the midst of them while they're still holding the stones in their hands. How I many know that if you're around him, everything's going to be okay? Well, he's saying, no, when I go away, the, the Holy Spirit's going to come the same way, and, and he's going to be pleading your case. And, one of the, and the only real example I see of that in the, in the Bible is after that little uh, fupa by Peter, where, you know, Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. He also says, you know what? The devil wanted to sift you like sand, but I've interceded for you. 
you did that stupid thing and you begin to thank his thoughts and, and then you had the audacity to let them out, out of your mouth instead of pulling down that stronghold and bring it into subjection. How I many know everything that flows between your ears is not a God. It needs to be sorted out, cleansed. Some of it needs to be pulled down. Some of it needs to be repented of. You know, as you walk with God and you begin to find out who you are, you start saying, I don't think that way anymore. I don't feel that way anymore. I choose this. I choose what the Word of God says. Now, flesh, get in line. <laughs> Jesus calls that comfort. Because <laughs> in reality, it is. If he can get you not to take the hard way. Because what I found out with God, <laughs> there, there was a movie years ago that had the rock in it, and he, he hunted down criminals, you know, guys that owed people money. And he walked up to him and says, now, you're going to give this to me, and here's the plan. You can do it the easy way. You can do it the hard way. Then he kind of leaned in, you know, with his big muscles. I choose plan A. <laughs> we see that in the Word of God. You're going to keep a, a sabbatical year every seven years, and if you don't do it, when they tally up big enough, I'm going to send you into bondage so the land will have its rest. It will have its seventh year. Now, you can do it the easy way, or you can do it the hard way. How many times have God, you know, it's, it's the 900th time around this same tree that he has taken me, and I'm still refusing to cross over the Jordan. And God's saying, listen, you, and we gripe at God about it. He said, listen, you could have crossed over into the Jordan the first trip around, but you wouldn't do it. And we say, well, why is God letting this happen to me? He didn't. He was trying to teach you. If you go on a cross, if you receive the correction, be courageous and go on a cross, you get comforted in obedience. Come on. Am I making sense this morning? Sure. Fruit of the Holy Spirit. Everybody knows what those are. But you know, you can't have them unless you let them teach you. You can't really have them unless you let him comfort you and come alongside you as a trainer, as a mentor, to sometimes to rebuke you, to sometimes to encourage you. That's why we have so many believers that very rarely will you ever see the fruit of their spirit in their life. They're unteachable. Well, I got grace. Do you know grace is the empowerment of God to walk in all this? Not to avoid it. It takes a strong man to walk with God. It takes a strong woman to walk with God. Because he's going to require you to strong arm your flesh. And as I learn to abide in Messiah by keeping his commandments and I'm letting the Holy Spirit teach me and I'm letting the sevenfold spirit of God begin to, to be that menorah in my life, it produces fruit. It produces meekness, long-suffering, kindness, all these things that are on short supply in the body of Messiah. How I many know we need to return to that? Yes, sir. God just said, and the body has a, not just this body, but the body universal has a, has choices. You can do it the easy way, or the body of Christ in America is going to learn how to do it the hard way. Because the only answer for the Laodicean church is to take away their wealth. Leave, take away everything that they trusted in because they made it an idol. And the only thing that God can do for their sake is to get rid of the idol. Right here is one all the Pentecostals love, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I love the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but a lot of things of what we're seeing manifested in church are not the gifts of the Holy Spirit because they don't represent his character. I read a book one time and I thought it was fascinating. How many know on the, on the uh, bottom of the high priest garments there were bells and pomegranates? The bells and pomegranates were there so that the bells would give a true sound. They buffer each other. The gifts and the fruit buffer each other. That's why the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians had to talk about love because love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit that needed to buffer the gifts. And what they were buffering the gifts with was pride. They get up and everybody spoke in tongues 
And how many know there's nothing wrong with speaking in tongues unless you're confusing it with the oracles of Delphi down the road that were setting over a, a sulfur pit and they would stammer on and then somebody would give the interpretation on the side. A counterfeit of the gifts. And so, and the thing is, in the pagan world, if you could do that, you were at the top of the food chain. And now God gives this gift to our believers, and instead of walking in love, it's like, Randai Shandai. Now God's given me a Hyundai, you know. All these, they, they were just boasting, and they were getting so busy in that, there couldn't be any praise and worship. There couldn't be any preaching of the word. There is a corresponding fruit of the Spirit that goes with every gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need His abiding. And I have seen men get up and supposedly move in the gifts and said they were apostles or prophets or whatever. And there was, there was such wrong fruit with it. There was such arrogance with it. There was, there was such a, a rough spirit with it that it wasn't the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It was another spirit prophesying, another spirit ministering. So everybody knows about those. I'm going to get into the last three that nobody wants to talk about. Shh. It'll upset the Christians. It'll upset the casual Christians. What am I talking about? The reproving series of the reproving ministry of the Holy Spirit. Turn to your neighbor and say, ouch! <laughs> Come on. Why? Reproving. Is el inco in the Greek, which means to convict, to refute, to confute, generally with the suggestion of shame of the person convicted, by conviction to bring to light, to expose, to find fault with, to correct by word, uh, to repre uh, reprehend severely, to chide, to, ab uh, to admonish, reprove, to call to account, to show one his fault, to demand an explanation. Oh, my word. Have you ever had the Holy Spirit show up in your life and demand an explanation from you from what you just did? Sure. Son, you ain't never had a dressing down till the Holy Ghost shows up and says, Son, we need to talk. And it used to, I go, what? I go, what? <laughs> I know I've messed up somewhere. That last three we're getting into, this reproving. But doesn't the, word, doesn't, doesn't the Apostle Paul say the word of God is for correction, for reproof? That's right. That's right. There needs to be some reproofing in the body. We need to call out Jezebel. We need to call out the Nicolaitans. We need to call out all these different things. That we need to call out Hellenism that has crept into the church and say, this is profane and this is of God. That's right. Nobody wants to hear that. So what happens? We frustrate the Holy Spirit. Well, that's the very first one. He is going to convict and admonish about sin. About sin. In this day and this hour, guys, not only does the world not know what sin is, the church doesn't either. It doesn't know. And they look down their nose at you if you say violation of God's Torah is sin. Well, you need to quote the New Testament. Just did. It was sin, it is sin, and it will always be sin because I have a God who was, who is, and is forevermore, and he changes not. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many know in the millennial reign that adultery will not be kosher? That murder will not be okay? That bearing false witness will not be okay. The Holy Spirit 
has got to show the church what sin is first so that the church can start calling out the sins of the world instead of trying to figure out a way for them to be able to be identified with that sin. Trying to find our relevance. How do we find our relevance in this movement? You can't. It's a movement of sin. And we try to align ourselves to be relevant with it. Why? Because it, it's all right. The Lord will blink at it. Let me tell you something right now. We've got a dead stare at the Lord. He ain't blink for a while. We're coming to a time that he won't blink at it. He's not going to blink at ignorance anymore. We're at the end of this thing, not at the beginning of it. Guys, we're living in a time. This, this, is, this is amazing to me. I've got several Bibles. I don't know if this one was or not. But there used to be a time that men were killed for bringing this into China. Come on. Remember the time? Now most of the Bibles are printed there. So even in the darkest regions of China, not only are Bibles available, but they're printing them there so that all mankind is without excuse. Except we have the church in America say, I don't like that part of it. I got grace. No. Grace is the power of God not to sin. Not to give you a get out of jail card anytime that you want it. One preacher, his advertising is, God's not mad at you. Let me tell you something. Yes, he is. The wrath of God for sin was poured out upon Jesus on the cross. But after the cross, God's wrath is when you reject his son and what he really taught and who he really was and what he really stood for. Jesus did not change sin. Jesus called sin, sin. When he healed people, he didn't say, now I'm healing you, go ahead and go back out and do that. It's okay, because I'm here now. You know, here, within a year or so, I'm getting ready to go to the cross. It'll all be cool. Go and sin no more, lest something worse comes on you. And that is still the eternal word of God. That when I do receive grace, I receive forgiveness. That grace, one side of the coin, I can get forgiveness for it if I'm repentant. The other side of it is he now begins to give me the power never to go back to that thing again. And one of the things, and it's a strange statement by the Apostle Paul, and he doesn't really preface it or end it with anything. He says, beware of dogs. Did, did the Apostle Paul fear German shepherds? Maybe it was a little Yorkie that freaked him out. Just, the Bible says a dog will return to his own vomit. That's how heaven feels when you return to an old sin. You vomited it out. And then you go back to partake of it again. How many know we got grace not to do that? Once we learn what sin is, to not only convict us of sin, and believer, you need to have conviction of sin, it's a sign that you're a son. That you're not a bastard, that you're a son. His sons, he corrects. His daughters, he corrects. If you're never convicted about anything... You're not a child of Almighty God. He only corrects his own. But once I, re once I know what sin is, and he has not only convicted me, but, but admonished me. I like the flip side of that. He admonishes me. He shows me the penalty of sin and the harshness of sin and, and all the stuff sin opens up to and said, I, I want better for you than that in your life. Then he takes me on the next one. He begins to convict me and admonish me about righteousness. The reason we don't have the church walking in holiness is you can't walk in holiness if you can't tell the profane from the holy. If you can't tell the unclean from the clean. And they think we're cramping their style when we talk about pork, it's the other white meat. I mean, no, actually, even that advertising is, is false. It's red meat. But anyway, it's not chicken. <laughs> it's not turkey. But why do you teach a little baby? Don't you, especially if you have a dog in the house, if you run, you 
Don't take stuff out of Fido's bowl and put it in your mouth. Nasty, yucky, bad. Don't pick things up off the ground, covered mud or other things, and put them in your mouth. Bad. That's how you teach a baby. And baby steps are, God says, these things are bad. They're not food. Not food. Bad. Yucky. Boo. Boo. This family doesn't eat these things. If you can't get that, how are you going to get the more complex things in the kingdom of God? And we think being ornery or being some religious facade is righteousness. Righteousness is what is released in your life when you do the commandments of God. They are righteous acts. God has to find this is righteous, this is unrighteous, this is clean, this is cool, do this, don't do that. Doesn't this make sense? I mean, this... I still, you know, I, I talked about us getting into deeper things, but I still feel like I'm playing with little building blocks, you know. A, B, C, lucky they stack together, you know. But most of the body can't get that. We have our own pseudo thing of what righteousness is. And righteousness in most churches is learning how to play the religious game and the political games, dressing the best, and throwing the biggest money in the offering plate because that assures you a position on the board. In most churches, isn't that the political game? Look at the requirements just to be a deacon. They had to be holy men full of faith, of good report. I tell you what, when you go back to the Bible, half the deacons on the planet aren't really deacons at all. And really they're not because they think their, their position is not to wait on tables but to run the preachers. Okay. The last one's my favorite. If you can get this, this is sin, this is righteousness. You ready for the last one? Because this is where we get into spiritual warfare. This is judgment. Because Jesus went on to say, the God of this world, the prince of this world is already judged. Do you know that every time you pray for somebody and God turns that situation around in their lives, you just reminded the devil that he's judged. He was judged so they could be set free. Whenever you pray for somebody and they're healed, that spirit of infirmity is judged so that they can be set free. Anytime anybody has a bondage broken in their life, that thing was judged. But see, if you don't understand what sin is, if you don't understand what righteousness is, you can't get the divine judgment. And when you start talking to believers about judgment, they get all stupid on you. I don't, I'm trying to find a nice word, and I can't find it. They get scared. God's going to judge. It's almost like Barney Fife in one of those old movies. Or what's, what's not Barney Fife, but what's that guy? John Knox. All I said was judgment. I, I know. <laughs> they get crazy. The Bible says that the righteous rejoice in judgment. Why? Because the kingdom of darkness is going down. I have known what the clean and the profane is, and I have cleansed my temple. I have dedicated my temple, and I've let the light come on, and I've let the Holy Spirit teach me from that book what is right, what is wrong, what are his ways, what are pagan ways, and I have separated the two, and I've put the filth outside the camp, and I buried it. And because of that, that's why Jesus said, when you do that in my name, you'll be able to cast out demons. You'll be able to speak in other tongues. You, you, you shall be able to lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And Mary and I have literally lived to one that you shall eat any deadly thing that shall not harm you. Yeah. Wasn't necessarily pleasant coming out, going out. It worked out our skin in, in chunks of metal. But how many know that's a whole lot better than dying? I'd, I'd take living and just letting it work out, work out of me a whole lot easier than the other. Oh, yeah. The word's true. Yeah. Most Christians, guys, today, when they're trying to cast out devils, it's either an emotional show. Because how many know some people like attention? They'll pretend to have a demon all day long as long as it gets them some attention. And I've seen that. I also know in some ministries where things like that are staged to rev up the service. Well, if you need to rev up the service, why don't you go ahead and get that little carnival box and get a monkey to jump around and you can... 
How many know that doesn't belong in church? But whenever they run up against a real one, the fur that's flying is their own. Because they end up being the seven sons of Sceva. How can you have authority over a demon when you're doing his stuff and his stuff is all over you? He looks at you and said, I see you all over me. Who do you think you are? You can't even take authority over your flesh not to do my stuff. And you're going to try to cast me out of somebody else when I can see all my kinfolk living in you. But when you're clean. Because the Holy Spirit has convicted you. He has admonished you. He has taught you. He has comforted you. He has shown you the right way to live. And you stand completely in the blood of Messiah. And you have, you have the blood over the doorpost. And you have taken out every unclean thing that would offend the Most High God. Guys, I've seen when that happens and you can try to get someone else to begin walking the same way. Deliverance takes about three seconds. It's like you saw it caught and its eyes went, whoop. Okay. Gotcha. In the name of G. <laughs> and it's saying, I'm out of here. By, it doesn't have a legal right to stay. Its stuff isn't here. It was caught. And you can start judging things because there is something called righteous judgment. I judge this right. I judge this wrong. You know, if you came in this morning and you had sickness in your body and I prayed for you to be healed, that is me judging that that sickness is wrong. That's not God's best for you. Nor is it the work of God. I've always been fascinated by denominations that say, well, you know, God can use, healing, or use sickness and disease, and, you know, really God doesn't heal anymore, but the first time one of them gets sick, they're asking for the whole church to pray against the will of God. <laughs> if they really believed sickness and disease was the will of God, you would not pray for God to heal you. If, you can't speak out of both sides of your mouth. So the devil... Let's see what we need to do. Let's find the door. Let's get it closed. Let's ask forgiveness or whatever we need to do and get that thing gone. That's right. Sometimes it's instantaneous. Sometimes it's progressive. But I, we need to get to the place where it ain't going to hold on. We're going to hold on till it's gone. That's right. It's all about the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. It's not putting on a show. It's living righteously. Living the kingdom the way it's supposed to be. And as we're entering into the Feast of Dedication, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just turn on your light all the way. I'm not asking for a 5-watt bulb. I'm asking for one of those 500-watt bulbs that there's nothing that can be hid in the brilliance of your light in our lives. That you would show us any door. Father, I don't care if it's a little crumb in the furthest back corner of our temple. Father, we want it out. Give us the grace to get it out. Because we want to be... You see, the whole cool thing about Hanukkah, if that had not happened, Jesus would not have had a dedicated cleansed temple to go and minister in. It's in a sense, it's a part of preparing the way for the Lord. And how many know the Lord's coming back? And it's time for us to start preparing. He's coming back for a bride without spot nor wrinkle or any such thing. She's going to have all her teeth. Come on. She's going to know how to operate in a Jewish court. She's not, going to, she's not going to have a pork sandwich stuck in her lunchbox waiting for him to come back. But she is going to know how to operate in that kingdom, and she has adorned herself with holiness, with righteousness, and has allowed the Holy Spirit to restore her to where she's supposed to be. Now, Father, we thank you this morning in the name of Jesus for your word. Father, we thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And Father, turn up the light. Lord, if there's anything in us unclean, we just ask that the Holy Spirit would show us. Doesn't need to show our neighbor. Doesn't need to show the preacher. But Father, just show us as individuals so that we can have your grace to get rid of it once and forever, Father. Father, let it be in our lives, we ask, in a fresh and a real way. Holy Spirit, come and minister. Light your temples with your presence, we ask. In Jesus' name.